So hello and welcome back for part two of the final project recitation. So far we've talked about the learning objectives. We've talked about the first part, which is path following, which is where you send in topological commands like straight, right, left, and terminate. And then the robot goes from a start position to a goal position. So this is an example of path following where you're given the path. The next phase is now going to be path planning and path following, where instead of me giving you the path, you have to create your path by knowing the start and the goal position in a known map. You will be given the maps in matrix form as either a topological map or an occupancy grid. As I said before, you can modify it to be either one. It's your choice, but that's just the way I will describe the world. And then the robot needs to go from the start to the goal position. Always be thinking about using your behaviors. Follow center, follow left, follow right. How can you correct that odometry error as it moves by using the encoders, by using the IMU, by using your steps, your P feedback, your PI feedback, your PID, PD feedback. All right, let's head back in. So now let's talk about path planning. We use wavefront propagation or grass fire expansion or some call it A star or D star search in order to do path planning. And the way it works is we label the start and the goal in our world. You can label those with some high number like 100, whatever. They're going to all get written over as the robot pans the path. So the starting number doesn't really matter as long as you know what your start and goal are indicated as. Then what happens is you grow the steps from the goal. You can either use a four neighborhood or an eight neighborhood the main difference is whether the robot will make north, south, east, and west movements, or it can also make diagonal movements. Then you label any obstacle as 99 or something, once again, like an occupancy grid, so that the robot knows that's not a navigable space. And then you count the steps. So one step from the goal is a one, two steps from the goal is a two, three steps from the goal is a three, and so on, building either the four neighborhood or eight neighborhood all the way back to the start. Then you encode the movements in the robot so that it counts down to zero. And once it arrives at zero, it knows it's reached the goal. There are many ways to do this. Like I said, if you're not gonna do diagonal movements, because that does create the shortest distance, but that also creates more odometry error, then the robot could just go straight and try to minimize turns. So the robot could go eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. It could follow right along that left wall or right wall, depending on how the robot's driving, I guess, and arrive at zero, or it can make diagonal movements. And that's what grass fire away from propagation is. So in the lab, what you will show me on your GUI or your serial monitor or wherever, is that you're able to take a map of the world and you can encode it with the steps that the robot has to move. And then what I should see on the floor is the robot actually following that path to get from a start position to the goal. During the demo, you're given the map, you're given the start position, you're given the goal and everything else needs to happen in your algorithm. So here's another example of what that looks like with an eight neighborhood on a different world where we're going from the start to the goal. And once again, you start down here, you count down nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. As long as the robot maximizes the distance so it doesn't hit the obstacle. This is another reason why you don't wanna sometimes do diagonal. You may have to grow your obstacle to keep from hitting it if you're trying to cut corners through an obstacle. So now let's look at an example of students doing this with their GUI. This is a cloud. Uh, we're doubling matrix following. We want to go from that corner to this corner. So it's from 0, zero to 3, three. Uh, uh, zero, 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 zero. This is the passage.
dog. We are demoing nature pass following. We want to go from dog to here. So it's from zero zero to sweet. So the next task is going to be localization. As we've discussed before, what you're going to do is you're given a map and you encode it with distinctive places or gateways where the robot can make navigation decisions, such as hallway, T-junction, dead end, corner, etc. And then the robot has to determine where it is in the world based upon what the topology looks like. So for example, if you don't use orientation and you just the robot recognizes that it is in a dead end there are one two three places it could be in the world so there's a 33 percent chance it's here here and here if you also don't use odometry which is the most general type of localization as the robot's moving forward it recognizes it's in a hallway and so not knowing the length of that hallway it could be moving towards this point moving up towards this point or moving out of this corner here then as it moves and it recognizes that it has a hallway on the right hand side then it knows that it's either up here or down here which are the only two places where i could have a hallway on the right hand side so once it gets to this opening it's a 50 percent chance that it's here or here and then once it moves forward and it hits another dead end it knows it no longer can be here so the robot has now 100 percent localized just by based upon these nodes that connect distinctive places in the world. So here is an example of what localization looks like on our robot. So what we did was... March, top localization. Keep going, I'm listening. So what we did was, um, once it found where it was, it mm -hmm. would generate the wavefront and then it would reorient the robot to be facing in the direction of the next lo valued lower cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would then follow... And then it would, Wrote called the path planner for the first instruction to go mm -hmm. forward. And that wasn't a hack. Yeah. And then it would just follow the path planner from there out. And that eliminated all the issues we were having. I see. I think Marge is going to make it. So currently we're at a 14 right now. Uh,
Okay, so this is localization. Um, so for the map of the world, we've translated it to our cell numbers. So we are starting um, in 3, 2, and we're going to find out where we are once we end in 0, 2. In our sense, this is 11 and 8. Um, what you're going to see over here as the robot's moving is this is going to say this is where we think we are. Um, and then once it settles into one location where it knows it is, it's going to update our GUI with graphics. Let's go and start here. So we now think we're either, we were in 3 or 11. You can see the numbers at the bottom. We now think we're either in 1, 2, 9, or 10. Same thing. We finish in and 0, boom. 2. We are currently right there, and that is where we started. So our last challenge is map making. And for map making, it's very similar. Some students choose to do map making first, then localization, or localization, then map making. So they can use some of that same theory on the next part. And essentially what you do is you come up with a way for the robot to navigate the world, whether that's follow center, Voronoi diagram, follow left, follow right, etc. I You know in advance that the robot is in a six foot by six foot world described by four by four cells, either occupancy grid or topological map. But what these numbers represent is as the robot moves, every time it gets a hit, the probability of that being a wall gets higher and higher. And shown here, the darker the values is the more hits it's gotten. And once it exceeds a threshold, you can say with some confidence that is most likely a wall. So by doing that, as when the robot finishes driving around, it then generates this map. This is called HIMM as described in your book, Histogramic Map Making. And here's an example of what this looks like. This is Electro performing autonomous uh, mapping and flat petting. Path planning, not flat planning. Um, so he's going to move to a new cell uh, every movement, uh, and then once he moves to that new cell, he's going to record uh, his cell information. Um, so right now, he's going to record that as a, what, what would that be? That would be a 13. That would be a 13. He's going to record that as a 13. He's going to reverse out of that 13, spin 180 degrees to get our uh, heading, as we call it, proper. And then he's going to spin another 90 degrees to move in the proper direction. Uh, we also might have to move Electro a little bit uh, for odometry's sake. Um, sometimes uh, he doesn't catch his front sensor like we would expect him to. So right here, I might move him forward a little bit. Hopefully he got that one. I'm going to go double check that he did. And yep, he got three. So again, we might have to move him forward a little bit here for odometry's sake. So he's going to spin to that outside corner, just going to center him a little bit. Note that behaviors forward. would have helped with not having to do so that if you stick with follow center. Ideally it would fix itself. We also have a delay um, on Electro, you can see him stopping at points. Uh, this is to make sure that uh, he's transmitting and expecting to do what we want him to do. So again he's going to back up. Uh, do a 180 and then do a 90 to get to this one and then once he's done uh, mapping um, we also have the autonomous path planning so all of his LEDs will light up for the path planning um, and then once all of his LEDs light up and turn off he's done planning his path now he just needs to do his uh, go to goal uh, which is 2-2 in our case and then after we're done with all this we'll show you the map that we built Okay, so he's done path planning, um, and now he's going to move forward a little bit, one by one. So he's going to spin, might have to move him a little bit. So right now he's moving forward like we would expect him to. an outside corner here for the behavior and then he's going to spin. Try and center him again. Wow. 
Okay, he's gonna move forward. Move forward. And then hopefully. Ooh. So we move forward a little bit too much there, but that's okay. And then he's gonna come here and then move forward a little bit. Actually, he's gonna be done. So that was 2 2. So he started over there um, at, what's that, 3, or sorry, 2 0, and then ended at 2 2. And then, as you can see, this is our map that we calculated. This was the path planning. And then that is the map that we discovered. Yep. Hello, Dr. Barry, and welcome to our mapping video. Before me, you see the GUI, which right now has assumed that every single cell is an obstacle. As the robot moves through, it's going to update saying this is not an obstacle. And these are where the robot is seeing um, walls from the IR readings. So you're going to see the robot turn a lot. It likes to read in this orientation. We have a custom send format that we're looking for, so we kind of need the robot in that position. So you're going to see the robot move a lot just to line up like this um, in each cell so these values are correct. Garrett, would you like to explain the robot? And how Basically, you... we are started in the bottom left corner or three zero and your standings three in our standings. Um, so basically the row is gonna move through autonomously and get in the correct orientation like Taylor was saying and then update the map accordingly at every cell that it can go into. So without further ado, let's begin. So we can see on the GUI, you can see it updating the IR sensors, and um, you'll see in a moment that we've just detected a new one. No one. And hey look, we're in the corner right now, so it's kind of cool because the way we've set it up is live. Plus, you know, we have a whole new world because we're showing you a whole new world. <laughs> Comical. Hey, I'm freaking fast. Uh, just like Kiri. I believe they carry. So before we look at the final GUI, we're going to be looking for two full obstacles and then a wall in between and we'll also be picking up the IR readings from all the side walls. And so that is what we can see here, 5 and 9 and 7 and 11 are full obstacles. You can kind of trace the outside and see these red blocks represent that the wall is detected and we can also see the inner wall is represented with the IR readings here. And this concludes part two of the final project recitation and all of the required parts for the final project. Remember your grade is based upon how many of these tasks you're able to complete. In the next and final part, we will talk about the optional part, or if you're a grad student, the required part that would be extra credit for undergrads and also about the final project report. Make sure you come back for part three and watch part two multiple times if you need to and ask any questions you may have.